And now, uh, it's my very great pleasure to spend just a moment giving you an introduction to Judy Lewent. Judy is a 1972 gra graduate of the MIT Sloan School. Um, many people in the room know Judy and many more know of Judy. Uh, she is an acknowledged and visible leader in the world of finance and organizations broadly and in the world of life sciences. Judy served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the pharmaceutical firm Merck. She continues to serve on the Board of Directors for um, Motorola Solutions, for Thermo Fisher Scientific, um, and for GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, Judy also serves MIT in multiple roles. She's a member of the MIT Corporation, and she is the chair of the MIT Sloan School, uh, America's Executive Board. I've known Judy for over 10 years. Uh, I respect her greatly. Um, I always enjoy time with her. She is a principled, innovative leader, and it's my great joy to ask Judy to join me up here. We're in the right seats now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so Judy, we've never met. <laughs> um, 1972 was a little different time to be at MIT in the Sloan School, maybe? Yes. Uh, so I want to say thank you for spending this time here today um, and invite you maybe to start by talking about that experience. What was that journey like in 1972? So yes, it was radically different. Um, and it was great listening to, to, to Steve talk about his journey. The, uh, to start with the difference in 1972, I have to go to 1970, when every business school except Harvard admitted students straight out of college. And I'm not making value judgments about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. For me, it was a great thing uh, because in my summer internships, I use the term loosely, I realized that the opportunities for a woman who wanted a career with a bachelor's degree were not going to be very interesting. And so it was great that doors opened to me at quality business schools to get a master's degree and so hopefully have some credentials that would open more doors um, than would have been the case otherwise. And I love your statistics. 41% is a huge accomplishment. Um, and I know it hasn't been easy. And many of us who've gone on the journey have always wondered why were we stuck at 25% or 30%, you know, and, and to get to 41 is, is terrific. Uh, for me, uh, the class ahead of me, our class size was more like 160-ish. The class ahead of me had two women. Uh, my class, I think, mounted a mighty eight women. And the class behind me had one or two women. Uh, having said that, though, I never really felt that at Sloan because it really was, you know, to me, something that I've always valued in life, which was a meritocracy, and that it was you were as good as your intellectual capabilities, your, your, your in insights, that kind of thing. And we were reminiscing last night at dinner. It is true, and I will name a name because Stu Myers has been a a valuable resource and mentor and teacher to me my whole life, and I think I have every edition of Principles of Corporate Finance um, that he's ever <laughs> issued. But having said that, sitting in his like intermediate finance course at the beginning of the semester, he said, "This, you guys will do this this semester, you guys will do that. Now this was 1971 or something, so you guys was not a generic term. You guys meant you guys. Um, <laughs> And I said, I can't be the only woman sitting in this room. And I was. Somehow I was dead center in the middle. I don't know, but, <laughs> but I was. So, but, but again, what, what I got out of it was, uh, well, the intellectual um, rigor, um, my bent and passion towards applying that rigor analytically to be data-driven, um, the access to leading-edge research in you know, whatever era, but of course our era was a pretty important one because uh, Myron Scholes was there 
And Bob Merton was there teaching all of us about option pricing theory before they had published their, even their first working papers. And uh, in having the privilege of continuing to know Bob Merton and Myron, uh, of course, over the years, Bob talked about how what he loved about Sloan in those days, and it's true to this day, was bringing research into the classroom, and that's what I valued. Um, you were part of that process, uh, and faculty really felt that this was a community where you were exploring you know, uh, the frontiers of knowledge. So um, I took all of that you know, away with me um, and uh, uh, have a, had a, an evergreen, perennial, relationship with the faculty and students at Sloan, which has enriched my life. And I'd like to think, you know, as Steve talked about, you know, being externally oriented and facing, uh, I encouraged all the people in the Merck Finance Organization and in other disciplines to have access to the ongoing pursuits at Sloan in terms of, again, thinking about important problems in the world uh, and bringing rigor to those problems. Um, so. Um, maybe that sort of gives you a flavor. I, I'm glad to hear that the ideas and the rigor were appealing and were um, an avenue for you to, um, to lead and to be recognized. Can I just ask one more question about that? Was it socially awkward or not awkward? Was it, oh. did it just feel natural to be, uh, how did it feel? It, 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 yeah, it felt very natural. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, again, it, it's sort of interesting that I don't think about the small numbers mm -hmm. uh, because we were a small school too and it was a community and it was actually very informal. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, ne I, never really, I, I never really thought about that um, with my fellow students or yes. with faculty um, at all. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and so um, you headed out and yes, I did. Uh, had some professional success. <laughs> uh, it took a while. Uh, so we'll touch on that yes. also. Yes. Uh, um, but I know that you, um, um, you've thought about mentoring, uh, being mentored and being a mentor. Can you say a little bit about that? Because sure. that was part of, I think, your development. Yes. yes. So um, uh, Again, there's going to be parallels here. I'm just thinking about what Steve touched on. Um, uh, my first mentor was my grandfather, uh, my maternal grandfather, who believed that women should be treated as equals, who believed that women should be educated financially so that they can stand on their own two feet. Mm -hmm. um, and he would talk to me about American history, and he helped me. Uh, learn to read the stock pages. In those days, they were stock pages um, at the age of seven and things like that. So very, very empowering and a philosophy that um, my family would support me in terms of any educational endeavor I wanted. It was up, just up to me to decide and up to me to achieve, uh, which is very liberating. So I would say he was the first, and he also talked about certain attributes, including courage and the courage of your you know, your convictions and the courage to make your own decisions and to take risks. And that really has stayed with me to this day. Um, as I went on my career journey then, um, uh, it took a long time to find, you know, a true mentor. And I would say, in many respects, um, as much as a mentor, I think the word in my case is sponsor, yeah. uh, because the the person who at the time was the head of the Merck Research Labs, Dr. Roy Vagelos, got to know me. Um, and I actually was the first finance officer in the research labs, which I loved. And we built you know, mutual respect. And when he went on to become CEO, chairman and CEO, um, uh, and my supervisor recommended uh, me to be treasurer, um, as I am told, I was not in the room, but as I was told, um, uh, some of the uh, other members of the senior leadership team, um, who were all not diverse, um, said that that would be disruptive to the men in the finance organization who had been there longer, and and so on and so forth. And Roy said, if that's your only if that's your only issue, we're moving on, and she's going to be treasurer, right? Um, and it takes someone in that position uh, who is a supporter 
um, who's willing to break down some barriers uh, that, that was invaluable. And again, and again, the last story on, with Roy is um, when I was named CFO, uh, he was all very excited about that in a very positive way. And uh, when the announcement went out, the calls came in to Merck asking, is, is she the first female CFO yes. of an S&P 500 company? No one at Merck had thought about that, because that just wasn't part of the decision-making process. Yes. Um, uh, then they scurried around and said, oh, yeah, actually, maybe. But, uh, but that, was not, that was not the world of Roy and my environment, which was really very supportive and also um, very analytically driven, very science driven, which was really fertile ground for me to, to yes. apply some of the learnings from Sloan, probably in the most productive way mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, that I was able to in my career. Uh, now, being a mentor, so... Uh, done a couple of things. Uh, always worked with the finance team to build uh, formal mentorship programs yeah. and, and a little bit of formal networking um, because we were in disparate locations and so on and there were, there were a lot of really terrific women in the Merck Finance Organization who didn't know each other. Um, uh, as I reminisced last night, I did get a little flack from some of the men for doing it, but you know, uh, you have to do that. And then personally mentored quite a few women one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, did you seek them out or did they seek you out um, or was it both? It, I would say it was more the natural evolution of uh, developing talent in the mm -hmm. finance organization. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so that, that kind of thing, yeah. um, as opposed to, yes. so, it was, so it was mostly women, uh, you know, high potential women in mm -hmm. Merck Finance. Yes. Uh, now obviously outside of that, I did do a lot of, uh, as time went by, um, speaking to smaller groups and informal groups about, you know, career and issues and things like that within Merck um, and sharing yes. and uh, hopefully empowering. So, yeah. Um, one of the things that I've heard you talk about, I suspect with some of those groups as well, as well was uh, perseverance or the, <laughs> you know, um, maybe not everything is laid out for you yes. in a straight path and so on. Uh, what, what would you tell someone about yes. <laughs> your experiences and the need for that? Yes, well, so, someone I met early in my career s talked about his career. He became an ex extremely successful uh, well, billionaire, um, but uh, said you have to keep knocking on doors till one opens. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, in, you know, sort of embedded that in my thinking. Um, Merck was the fifth company I worked for coming out of Sloan. Yes. Um, and when I... Fifth. Yeah, let me get kind of... And, and you started there in 1980? Fifth. And you yes. graduated in... I made tracks. <laughs> Never Correct. Mind. That math works, yes. Eight years, four companies. Wow. Yes. One was a nine-month door-to-door. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but lots of learnings. Lots of learnings. Lots of learnings. I, I mean, did you ever wonder if, you know, this was going to be it for, you know, just... Yes. Till well, the... so in this company, the, the, the one I was at uh, for nine months, um, uh, I had developed a friendship, which I have to this day, with one of my fellow women. And she said, um, my career aspiration is to be treasurer of a company. And I thought, that is real, and I'm serious, but that is really admirable because there's only one treasurer in each company. There's no way I'm gonna be treasurer of a company. You know, I mean, I just want a, I want a job, you know? Yes. I wanna be able, to, I want a, a finance job. You know, I mean, I wanna I want yeah. be able to be on a team and do some analytics and feel part of a group, right? Uh, but yeah, there, there were, and there were a lot of learnings, obviously, in that little journey. Um, but I was, uh, I was a little more, um, I guess, experiential as opposed to uh, one of these long-range planners. I'm going to go here, 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 and here. It's sort of, I had my first opportunity, which I thought I'd really like, and I learned from that, yeah. and then let sort of uh, opportunity take me. And I've, and I've always felt when I've listened to other speakers, uh, 
to MBA classes and someone say, well, you know, I knew I, knew I had a five-year plan to be a CFO, and I went, good for you. There's like no way. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be really disappointed. That's not the way the world works. But in any event, um, yeah. and then when I got to Merck, yeah. it just sort of all mm -hmm. clicked. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't all easy, uh, and it wasn't without some, you know, uh, culture change and resistance on the part of yes. some of my peers. Yeah. But, you know, it's one at a time, slowly, slowly. And yes. it was 27 and a half years in the end at Merck. Yes. So I, I put down roots finally, mm -hmm. you know. So on average, you're quite typical. Exactly. <laughs> right. uh, um, so I, I know a fair amount about uh, the trajectory of the finance work that you did at Merck. Um, I want to ask you about some of the more maybe complicated partnership activities that Merck was involved in. And I, I wonder if that drew in a different way on the same expertise or asked other kinds of expertise of yep. you. There was a joint venture with Johnson & Johnson. Yes. Um, there was activity with DuPont, yes. I remember. Um, Sanofi Aventis, I yes. think, was another. And yes. so um, uh, those can be um, maybe um, uh, risky uh, activities uh, for the firm, obviously, but for someone who's um, given a leadership responsibility. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like to have those responsibilities? Yes. And, and the flagship is Astra, but I'll come oh, back yeah. to it. Yeah, that, yes. I'll come back to that. Yes. Yeah, Merck, Merck had decided, um, well, actually, one of my first assignments when I got to Merck was one of the leaders had an idea, which was a great idea, called the Second Pharmaceutical Company, where he thought we could try to leverage our capabilities and marry them with another pharma company's mm -hmm. pipeline um, and uh, see if we could have some synergies without going the acquisition route. Uh, and, and that ended up, I was part of a team, and that ended up being our relationship with Astra, which started out as an in-licensing with a contract that led to the fact that if we hit a certain milestone, we would set up a joint venture. Mm -hmm. By the time we set up the joint venture, I was in a more senior position and was asked to basically be the co-chair. Um, we adopted at Merck this whole philosophy of looking at joint ventures as an avenue mm -hmm. to external growth without going the full M&A route. Mm -hmm. And so J&J &J Merck was our um, um, partnership to do RX to OTC switches. Uh, DuPont was a slightly different one where DuPont had a small pharma business mm -hmm. uh, which really didn't thrive in a chemical company and, and it did thrive when we put it together as a joint venture and I co-chaired co that. Mm -hmm. And what we call Marial was an animal health joint venture which has, was extremely successful as, as well uh, with Aventus, with Santa Fe Aventus. Um, mm -hmm. so, all of those structures were fundamentally 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, all of them had a, C, a dedicated CEO, mm -hmm. and then we had co-chairs, and we had boards. Uh, and it was a completely different kind of an experience because, yeah. first of all, you have really three different parties at the table. I mean, the CEO yeah. is trying to run a business mm -hmm. and then balancing two partners, and the two partners will always be really aligned when things are going really well, um, but come from different cultures, too. And I mean corp corporate cultures and even different horizons, right? So um, you know, Merck is a pharma company, and our horizons are very long, uh, both our R&D life cycle and our product life cycle, and it's a, it's a, it's a long horizon business. Quite frankly, J&J is a consumer business. It's a very short horizon business. And so there were very interesting discussions about resource allocation and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, even employee compensation and things that we all worked out well together, mm -hmm. but you had to bring everyone together. And so what that really meant was um, honing in, you know, interper interpersonal skills, right? And, yes. and learning to, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, and our board meetings were really operational meetings, and we also had a lot of what I would call executive committee meetings where my co-chair and I would meet together and with the CEO and 
that kind of thing. And um, I found it an extremely uh, rewarding uh, endeavor in that uh, you did build businesses, you did learn a lot from another company, another approach. Um, and you did learn how to keep everyone, or try to keep everyone aligned yes. to focus on the objectives. Having said that, um, I was also thinking about the long partnership that I had with Bob Gibbons, who was very interested in a lot of the same topics and um, a little bit with a game theory. MIT Sloan School professor. Yes, sorry, yes. I took that as a given, but you're right. Um, uh, and one of the things that he found interesting, which I was reflecting on before today, is that I mentioned to him that um, the, all of those relationships um, required uh, at formation detailed contractual agreements, I mean extremely detailed contractual agreements. But the fact of the matter is, is that the day you had to reference them was the day you had a problem with the joint venture. And, and, and you basically kept those agreements in a, t in a desk drawer. Um, and uh, so there were many stories when it came out of the drawer and many successful stories when it didn't have to come out of the drawer. Uh, but there were a lot of lessons learned. And there were a lot of lessons learned too in terms of what worked and what didn't work in deals. And just one example I'll give was the DuPont Merck joint venture. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought it was a great idea and you can understand it. Had a, it had a look back five years out where five years into the joint venture there were reciprocal you know, put options and things like that. And there was also going to be uh, a truing up of the economics with, under the umbrella of fairness and balance. And Who all could be of, against that? Yeah, exactly. And all that that did in the end was, I mean, game theory will tell you, is when you know that there's, a, there's an, an end five years from now, the organizational dynamics and the partner dynamics in terms of investing in a business, let's say starting in year three, maybe get a little altered um, than having a, you know, an unfettered long-term you know, view of the business. Uh, the great fairness and balance true up was an opportunity for dissension because with everyone's best you know, intentions of defining what went in and how you calculated it when you actually had a real business, well, maybe you didn't actually anticipate X, Y, and Z. And I, I don't want to talk, talk about how many negotiating sessions went on on that, which doesn't, doesn't bring partners together and doesn't build harmony and unity of purpose and focusing on investing and building a business. So you learn. You know. yes. um, it seems like it took you pretty far from the typical concerns of a treasurer or even a CFO um, in strategy, managing people, incentives, corporate culture, seeing different organizations, cultures, and so on. Um, did you, can I just ask, did you seek out those opportunities also, or were they, you know, let me say thrust upon you in some, uh, <laughs> some Shakespeare, sense? Shakespeare, yes. yes. Uh, uh, I, did, I did not seek them out. Mm -hmm. um, I had been in, with my other hat on in terms of being responsible for M&A and licensing, yeah. uh, corporate development. Uh, had been at the table negotiating and helping to structure and think about all of those transactions. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and Astra, uh, in particular, um, over the years, and then we had a major restructuring that I led, and from nine, took two years from 1996 to 98. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the new CEO came in, Ray Gil Martin, mm -hmm. he looked around and said, and he saw what I had done there, and mm -hmm. offered me that opportunity as a development opportunity, yeah. and I thought that was great because of just what you said. It it completely changed a role for me and opened up a whole new opportunity for development that I didn't have. Prior. Um, so I'm going to ask you if I could a couple yes. more questions, yes. um, but we also have uh, polling uh, software and we will protect some time for questions from you all and I hope that you might take an opportunity to um, follow the instructions on the screen if you will and submit a question or two for Judy. Um, we'll be turning to those in a few minutes, five minutes, yes, good. <clears throat> so I want to ask you a little bit about MIT if I could. Absolutely. Um, uh, it seems like you've been fairly busy in your professional life, um, and so uh, I won't say nonetheless, but there was something that led you to engage with MIT, and I, I wonder if you could talk about that. So, yeah, so um, 
I always turn to MIT and Sloan in particular as uh, a critical part of my own professional development, uh, continuous learning, quite frankly, mm -hmm. in, in an unstructured way, but continuous learning, and recruiting. Um, and uh, valued every opportunity I had to come back to campus to meet with faculty, to learn about research, to meet with students, either as a recruiter or you know, as good or better yet in a classroom um, talking about different finance issues or experiences and so on and so forth. And uh, that basically has been part of my life, I think almost from the day I, I walked out the door uh, but clearly, I had a great platform when I got to Merck and a, and a, and a lot more opportunity as my roles changed too, mm -hmm. um, to engage. And um, uh, it provided, I mean, the faculty, the, the faculty um, access provided, again, the rigor and a construct and a, and a third party way of thinking of important decisions like foreign exchange hedging. Um, how do you assess an R&D investment, an R&D portfolio? Um, how do you think about capital structure? Mm -hmm. uh, these, some of them always were part of Stu Meyer's 10 unanswered questions in finance, yes. which will always be there, right? Yes. Dividend policy, capital structure. Um, but, but at least to have um, an opportunity to sit down at a table mm -hmm. and speak with people who um, have greater expertise than I and have the time and have been focusing on those and then look, looking at empirical data to, to share as an insight or as a guidepost is invaluable. Um, uh, I will also say that uh, then being asked first to be on the visiting committee of Sloan before I even was on the corporation, I think I've been on the visiting committee of Sloan since 1989, I think, I'm not sure, it's something like that. Um, and shared it probably for, I don't know, doesn't matter, 10 years or something like that. Sounds right. Uh, and I'm, I, they still let me sit on the visiting committee. Of they do, yes. Um, <clears throat> provides yet another dimension of which Dave shares with all of you and with the executive boards, which is I think really important, is an appreciation of more from a management side, from a financial side, mm -hmm. uh, what's going on at the school? Mm -hmm. What are the key issues? What are the opportunities? Is the leadership team, quite frankly, you know, using what is taught at the Sloan School and thinking strategically and thinking financially prudently about where they want to go and how you mar marry financial strategy with operational and business strategy and you know getting where you want to go, um, and to get that insight just gives you a deeper appreciation of um, what's needed at Sloan. I mean, in terms of from my own philanthropical standpoint, but I would say more importantly, the appreciation of what a terrific position Sloan is in today, how far it's come, and quite frankly proves again that you can basically do anything you set out to do um, with the right thinking and the right discipline. So. That's really good. Um, you talked about the faculty, and I want to just, um, uh, there might be a compliment buried in this, so please don't listen to this next oh. part. But. Um, <clears throat> Maybe not all of the Sloan faculty are famous for their open door policy and welcome everyone. Uh, I, I do know from the faculty that you ask really good questions and you read and think and prepare. Um, what you also were doing with them, um, including especially at your time at Merck, was bringing to them uh, challenges, experiences, um, the stuff that honestly helped them think in some new ways about the problems that they're working on. And, um, if there's a compliment for you in that, which I hope there is, I think a little compliment maybe for the faculty also for being curious about your experiences and what could be taken or gleaned, you know, kind of from those experiences. Well, and thank you. I, I will say, so you triggered one other thought. Um, I am an open-minded person, so I do meet with faculty at other schools, which shall remain nameless, what? but, you know, both coasts, Midwest, you know, up and down the eastern seaboard, just to name a couple of geographical areas. In any event, what, what, I, what, I, what I always fascinated me was faculty really welcome that. 
and how few people take advantage of it. Yeah. In it. I mean, it just boggles my mind. And I mean people, I mean in corporate America mm -hmm. who don't understand the synergies and the opportunities that are there. Um, the only story I will say is, so mm -hmm. um, after many years, uh, I was on a business trip to California for pension and management, and we always had time to visit and do different things. And um, Ma Myron Scholes was at Stanford at yeah, the time. Yeah. And I said I really wanted to reconnect with Myron Scholes. And uh, there were a group of us on this trip, who cares, six of us or something like that. And the word came back that Myron Scholes would meet with us, but only two people could come in the office. And my boss got in this huff and indignant and saying, well, if that's the case, we're not going. I said, no, it's okay. You don't have to go. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, he joined me and then had great fun because when I was at Sloan, my hair was down to here. And now it was here. And he's sitting there going, and he, and he finally couldn't stand anyway. He said, don't, don't you remember who, do you know her? Do you remember her? And of course, Myron didn't, right? Because it had been whatever, umpty umpteen years and a, you know, a lot of other things, you know, water under the bridge or over the dam or whatever. Anyway, uh, but after that, we, we, re, we reconnected. So even yes. Myron was willing to see people, just yes. not a mob, mm. but you know. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and maybe a little reminder of something you said earlier about um, knocking on doors and yes. seeing which ones yes. will open, yes. um, because um, <laughs> sometimes they do, uh, although only a few people get through it, it seems. <laughs> um, then uh, we have the 10-minute warning, and that means uh, I put on my reading glasses, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm no. going to see what we have see for you, questions, please. and we'll test my... Um, um, there. All right. <laughs> Um, so um, this is a question, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but from Laura, MBA 1999. Uh, can you talk more about uh, changing culture in an organization, and um, this always seem to be among the most difficult things to change. I think maybe in these times that's a really good question. Yeah. It is. Um, I think back on the, one of the times that Merck was trying to change culture. I mean, in a dynamic environment, um, you have to move an organization along to be fit for purpose, as you said given where you are today and where you want to go as opposed to where you've been. Mm -hmm. And when, and when uh, a survey was done to, to, to sort of launch the process, uh, what came back always made an important impression on me, which was that Merck had an, I don't know how to describe it, had an, a very large uh, percentage feedback on very strong culture, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, like, top quartile of super strong culture, which was then pointed out to us was a disadvantage as well as an advantage. Because, because it was the, 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 the legacy culture, and it had many attributes, and it was one of the reasons why I loved being there in terms of the mission and in terms of the ethics and the values, and I just felt great about being part of Merck. Um, but when you're trying to change you have to open people's mind up to, okay, you want to keep the good, but there may be some other aspects, which I think every corporation deals with, which is, you know, whether it's bureaucracy, um, workload, uh, uh, too many reports, too many meetings, pre-meetings to the meetings, and all these kinds of things, which c come about because for all kinds of understandable reasons, but at some point have to change, and how do you get that done? And it is not, Fast. And again, you again, I'm echoing what you heard earlier, but it has to start from the top. Mm -hmm. And obviously, top means CEO, but then top means the head of each mm -hmm. function, right? Um, and uh, it it just it just takes a long time. I mean, the the one thing that I've now heard at one of my other boards and management presentations um, was we have to we have to eliminate. Um, make work. We have to streamline the workload. We have to eliminate unnecessary reports. Anyone who's figured out the real solution to that, anyone who's actually accomplished that, 
please come up to me, I want to know. Because I couldn't agree with that more, but getting that changed, I don't, it's intractable. And would it free up all kinds of resources and time and allow people to do productive work? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's just, it's not easy. I do also think, you know, part of that change process, again, is what you heard earlier, there are times when you need to change people in key roles. There's some roles where, you know, you just need new talent, and that's just unfortunately the way of the world. And you're not going to get where you need to go unless you, you know, make some of those changes. Yes. So um, I want to ask you a question that it's um, I don't know if it's unfair. We'll see. Um, uh, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, the question is simple. In your view. How do women of color advance? And this it goes on just briefly. Despite starting out with colleagues in a class, women of color tend to trail in promotions, regardless of high performance. Um, can you speak to that? Well, so he just brought back to mind one of uh, my mentees. Um, and uh, I think that really has to be the root. Uh, there, one of the women in the Merck Finance Organization, just an extremely talented African American woman, um, and uh, at basically everyone wanted to support her career development, and she had a great career track. Uh, having said that, for a variety of reasons, she left and went other places, and uh, the culture was not supportive. And I'm not saying African American either. I, I have a feeling it was gender and other things. But it is to say that um, every company does not have the same culture, and you have to look for those in those places that really sincerely are going to promote talent and and be gender and colorblind. Um, and I was really lucky to have a sponsor who was, and there are a lot of people I know at Merck who are, and there's a, there's a great roster of mm -hmm. talented people, diverse talented people who succeed tremendously. But unfortunately, that it's not even across companies and cultures. And so I, I, you know, I think it has to be pick the right place, and it also has to be then find the right mentor. Uh, yeah. Because uh, as much as, if you will, the coaching side, it's more to me, it's that opening doors or knocking down doors or barriers that the right mentor can do um, so that you can prove yourself and realize your full potential. Um, so I want to connect that with one of the other questions that was asked, uh, and it was about replacing a management team when you need to. Yes. I, I took your answer as being, as the question was asked, kind of from the perspective of the individual who's trying to move forward in the organization. But you could also take that question and ask it of a leader in an organization if the organization doesn't really seem to be um, uh, the meritocracy, or right. call it what you will, that you right. would like to see it be. Right. And does that perhaps sometimes require changing a leadership team, a, a management team? And how does one think about doing that? So, uh, did, say, I, did say, I ask that clearly yes, enough? Or? Yeah, say it one more time, because whose so, perspective? Right, so, so, so here's the person trying to do well in the organization, okay. uh, asking that question about um, people of color. Yes. Here's a management team. Yes. Maybe there's a good fit. Maybe the people are yes. aren't. You can switch to a different management team, yes. and so on. Now imagine somebody who is a leader in the organization, yep. maybe having some sense of this dynamic, yes. maybe not, yes. and yes. perhaps coming to a decision that change ah. here yes. needs to happen. Absolutely. I mean, you know, is. I don't mean that I, I shouldn't say this, but you know, does it mean sitting down and having a stern conversation with five people? Does it? I, does oh, it is it incentives? Sure. Is it? Nope. Is oh, it okay. changing a team in some other okay. way? Okay. And how, if I can adjust how you think okay. about that, that's okay. what I'm trying to ask. Okay. About. Yes. And that so, might have to be our last question. It does have to. Be. So there, there are so there, are, so there are many ways to gather insight in terms of whether it you know, what the issue is in the middle, right? Yeah. So before you get to that issue, um, again, uh, there are a lot of processes, and I, it's an over, 
use word, but that from the leadership team down have to be enforced. For example, when there's a job opportunity, mm -hmm. um, everyone has to put a diverse slate forward. Yes. And it's not gonna happen unless it's enforced, number one. And the usual excuse I used to hear was, mm -hmm. well, we're, we're, we're resource constrained, we have a tight time, time timeline, we don't have time for training, we, you know, so-and-so already knows the, the job, can step right in, and we just happen to be expedient, we have to do this. Well, no, you have to take the time, and you have to be willing to be patient, and you have to enforce that discipline of looking at a diverse slate, which, backing up from that, as a leadership team, we spent lots of time looking across our organization going through personal development plans, understanding you know, what the development opportunities and needs are, basically forcing rotation in certain cases because you don't want people in a job too long either. Yeah. Uh, you want them there long enough to be able to contribute, learn and contribute, but not so that yes. they get stale, quite frankly, or they block other people's development. That, is active, that has to be actively managed. Mm -hmm. And then you have other tools and metrics like um, now GSK use 180s. I love this. I've learned something new. There are 180s as well as 360s. Um, I personally like the Whirling Dervish 720s, but you know. <laughs> um, but nice. and you can start to root out where, where there are yes. some s yeah. issues with the leadership team mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. you know uh, other mm -hmm. kinds of things. And, and at some point, if you don't make those changes, then you've lost the battle. Um, because everybody knows, and you always, I've always found out in my, in my life, sitting down with someone and saying, you know, this isn't going to work is one of the toughest and most unpleasant things to do anyone can do. Yeah. Uh, and invariably, the person you're sitting down with doesn't have a clue, right? Yes. No matter how many reviews, no matter how, ma how much feedback, it's, I guess, hum human nature. But when that action is taken, all of a sudden you hear from people going, yeah, well, we knew that. What took you so long, right? So uh, again, if you don't close that loop, then you're never going to be able to have to put in place the kind of things you want for an effective organization and develop talent. Yes. Uh, so. Yeah. so I hope that you see Judy as an extraordinary effective leader of organizations. And we're very happy and proud to have Judy as a leader in our alumni community and MIT community. Judy, thank you for this time together. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.